So uh, this evening what I'd like to do is uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we consider to be church and what our paradigm of church is really all about. When we begin thinking about what church is, what is a traditional mindset? What is the things that we start thinking? Which the church is a place that we come to, the church is a place that we participate in. There's a lot of different things, right? But this evening what I want to talk about is what I believe that the, what scripture is really helping us to understand is that church is a place to go from, not necessarily a place to come to. And so with that, we're going to kind of launch right into this. So let's begin with a quick word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so very much for the opportunity now to be able to, to come to you, to look into your word, to understand what your heartbeat is about uh, what church is. And even more than that, Father, what your heartbeat is about who we are as the church and what our mission is on this planet. Uh, Father God, once again, hide me behind the cross. There's nothing here of any value unless you bless it, encourage it, and grow it in our hearts. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to take a little bit of a, a visioning time. I want you to imagine with me, if you will. I want you to think about yourself, and you end up with this alarm, this call that takes place. And with that call, you know what to call to do. You know you, right now i got to respond. So the next thing you see is yourself running into a burning building. Your responsibility is to go in, find the victim, drag them back out. Now you're running in as everybody else is running out. So you are the one who has to go in there and really do the job. And as you go upstairs, the smoke is uh, down low. And as you're walking around, you see a, a little uh, body of a little child there laying on the floor. And immediately your training kicks in. You run over to that body and you pick it up in your arms and you cradle it to your body. And the flames are burning all above your head and the smoke is coming down even lower yet. And you can hear uh, that this child is, is limp and almost lifeless. Uh, you can hear that there's no breath coming from this child. And so you dash down the stairs. You go out the front door and you finally get into the front yard. And, and there you are. You're finally safe from all the flames and all the smoke. And you lay the child down in the yard. And you realize that there's no breath at all. So the helmet comes off, the mask comes off, and immediately you start CPR and rescue breathing. And lo and behold, the child begins to cough and to sputter. The eyes uh, uh, begin to blink a little bit, and they open their eyes, they look up, and they give you that kind of a smile saying, thank you. And then the AM, EMTs arrive, and they put the child on their gurney, and they whisk the child off to the hospital, a quick check, everything's okay, and the child goes on with their life. Now fast forward a couple of decades. And as you're going from the, through the different firehouses, as you're going from place to place, you run across somebody that looks really familiar to you. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, that was that child from way back then. They're now grown and they're a firefighter themselves. And I want you to think about the ripple effect of the actions that you took on that one day where you had this opportunity to save a person's life. And you influence that life. And now that, in, that very same life has taken on the same responsibility that you had and is also out there saving lives. You not only because of your selfless act saved the life of one person, but for every person from that point forward that you had a chance and an opportunity to, to work through and to rescue, you changed their lives. And those also had ripple effects, as you can imagine. Now stop imagining and realize that as a Christian, that's exactly where you are. You are in an eternal fire rescue department right here. You have the opportunity given to you through Scripture, the authority, the responsibility, the knowledge, the gifting, the call to be able to work in a world where people are lost and dying. And at the end of it all, there's eternal flame if they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. What kind of ripple effect can you have in this life? Well, if we take a look at Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 39, Peter is speaking here, and he says this. Peter replied and says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift, the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all that are who are, who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Think about this gift. Think about the third part of the Trinity taking up residence within each believer. Think about the idea that the only 
reason, the only thing that you have to do to appropriate this wonderful gift is to repent, to turn from your sins, to turn to stop walking away from God, quite literally turning 180 degrees and walking back towards Him. That's what repentance really means. And so given that opportunity, you have the opportunity for this gift. So when you repent of your sin, when you have turned away from your life and back towards the life that God offers, you've been given this gift. It's the indwelling of the Spirit, but it doesn't stop there. You see, they have the opportunity to be able to share this with your children and with your family. And when they ask Christ to be their Savior, when they repent of their sins, they also receive this gift. And all who are afar off, so the ripple effects continue down the road. But notice also what it says in verse 39, that the promise not is for you, for your children, and for all those who are far off, for whom the Lord your God will call. So there's an alarm that goes out. As a result of this salvation experience, there's an alarm that goes out of duty or responsibility for each one of us to be able to recognize that we are part of this eternal fire rescue department, that we have the opportunity to be able to go and lead others to Christ. Notice what it says in Romans 11, verse 29, for the gifts and his call, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Now, it's for sure that each one of us have certain inherent gifts as well. We are born hardwired with certain talents and abilities. One of the abilities that I do not have is the, is the ability of music. Thankfully, this mic was off while we were singing. Otherwise, this room would be empty right now. But given the opportunity, I mean, there are things that I can do. I like to climb mountains. And it's a funny thing, but that can actually be used... Uh, for the Lord. There are opportunities. Uh, God was so gracious for uh, with me back in October of last year to be able to go and do this marvelous trek in Nepal. As a result, my guide came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. What ripples could that possibly have to change that family tree, to change the Sherpa community, to change the trekking community as we, Lord willing, will go back again this year and now we're going to be presenting the gospel as we go. What great ripples does this have? But you see, God's inherent gifts, the ones that he gives you, those certain inherent talents, are intended to be used for his purposes, for his glory. So they may be raw, in a raw state with you, but given the opportunity, God can use those and hone those uh, skills and gifts that you can then become uh, uh, a, a worker, a part of this uh, eternal fire rescue department, if you will. So he says that God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. In other words, that call goes out. Whether or not you respond is a choice. Now, when I had an opportunity to be on a volunteer fire department, I had a choice. The, in fact, the policy was 30% of the calls that go out, you need to respond to. But I had a choice to respond to those calls. As do you. You have that opportunity. But God's call is irrevocable. He doesn't say, well, you get a pass on this one. Each one of us have that call and that responsibility. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 down through 8. Notice what Paul says uh, to the Romans here. Verse 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to you. Now, why would he give such a warning? It's because human nature has a tendency to compare ourselves with ourselves, amongst ourselves. And so somebody will say, well, you know, brother, I, I can't stand up there and talk like you. So if I can't do that, why try? Why try sharing? Why try learning? Why do any of it? I, not, I may not be able to cook like somebody else can cook, so I, should, I guess I should never try to cook again. That's not the point here. What he's saying is rather than comparing ourselves to each other, rather than sabotaging the opportunity that we have set before us, then stop comparing yourself to everyone else. Stop looking and saying, you know, and the opposite is also true. We, in our human nature, have a tendency to say, hey, my talent's a whole lot better than your talent. Too bad for you. And that's not the case either. We shouldn't be that way. But he says to judge, or to not judge ourselves, to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but to think soberly, to see things as they really are, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to us. You know, there are those who have or appear to have this great faith, who are absolutely... Uh, fearless and undaunting in their approach uh, in their approach to winning others to Christ, in their approach to evangelism, in their approach to church growth. And there are others who, like me, I was born as a wallflower. I was very 
cautious in school, I was very careful. I was the smallest kid in my class. I was always the, the smallest one, it seemed like, no matter what I did. You know, when, as a freshman in high school, I was so embarrassed <clears throat> because everybody else was growing facial hair, and I mean, I was as smooth as could be. Matter of fact, I was 19 years old. I had been graduated from high school for two years, 20, I take it back. And I was in the service, and my sister came to visit me at the base. And at the end of a 10-day visit, she slid across the seat in the pickup truck, and she looked at my lip like this close away. She says, are you trying to grow a mustache? I thought I had a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> so not every one of us are gifted or given exactly the same thing. The same thing is true about the distribution of faith. Not all of us have that so-called great faith. But you know what's cool about this? We don't have to. Enough is sufficient. Understand what I just said? Enough is sufficient. If you've been given a measure of faith at all, it's enough. And it's sufficient for you to do what God wants you to do. Notice in verse 4, For just as each of us has, has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And again, begin to understand what's being spoken of here. When Paul is describing this, he's saying that we don't all have the same function. Now go back to the analogy I was using about a fire department. If we truly are an eternal fire rescue department, each one of us has a different responsibility, a different function. Not all of us are the same. Not only should we not compare ourselves to one another to sabotage the opportunities that are ahead of us, but we shouldn't be looking at each other and saying, well, his function is more important than my function. You know, simply because somebody stands up here and speaks or preaches doesn't make it any more important than somebody who runs a sound system or somebody who sets up chairs. They're just different functions, not different values. We've got to get this into our heads. Romans 12, uh, 3 through 8, we're continuing on now. Verse 6. Notice what he says. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Now, so apparently what's being spoken of here is God distributes faith differently. And now he's also extending grace differently because we've been given different gifts. If your gift is prophesying, when he's saying this, he's not... Please don't get the picture of an Old Testament prophet where God speaks to the person audibly and then they go and speak God's word and then they predict the future. Don't think of it in those terms. This particular use of the, of the Greek word that's rendered prophecy in the English here is really speaking about forth telling the truth. In other words, we study the scripture, we understand God's truth, and then we forth tell it. Okay, we bring it forth. We let other people know about that truth. So if he's saying, what he's really saying here is the gift of prophesying or forth telling that truth, then prophesy or tell that truth in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If you teach, if it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouragement, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, then do it diligently. And if you're to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. In other words, whatever your hand decides to do, do it with all of your diligence. Whatever that gifting is, then do it with all of your might. And do it for the glory of God. Notice in 1 Corinthians first, uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. Verse 4 says, and Paul again is speaking to the Corinthian church. He says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way. That's fascinating to me. God says that we are already enriched by virtue of the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells us. There's the gift. We're already enriched. With all kinds of speech and all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Verse 7. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift. Think about that. What does it say? I mean, come on. Is God telling us the truth here or not? Amen. Okay, good. The idea is this, that you've already been enriched in every way. You have the knowledge and the skill sets available, rough though they may be. They're there. Remember what I said a minute ago? Enough is sufficient. It's enough. You have it available to you. And now he says you don't lack any spiritual gift. So when I walk up to somebody and I say to somebody, hey, you know what? 
why don't you pray about going on a short-term mission trip with us? You know what the first two things I hear out of people's mouth? I don't have enough time, I don't have enough money. You don't lack any spiritual gift. I can tell that to you now. Right? I mean, if somebody, if I, if somebody starts to make excuses, I can say, hey, wait, you don't lack any spiritual gift. I won't do that to you because I don't believe in twisting your arm. But I could. But isn't it very true about how we approach being a testimony to others? Isn't it true that we do this little self-sabotage thing sometimes where we think to ourselves, well, you know, I really don't talk very well to other people, so I, I, I guess I'll try, you know, setting up chairs. Maybe that's the only gift that I've really got. Well, I think everybody can pretty much set up chairs. Maybe God's called you to something a little bit different than that. God's called all of us and given us all that opportunity to be able to share our testimony with others. And another excuse that I hear from a lot of people about why they don't share is because, well, my, my testimony is not very exciting. Eh? You don't lack in any spiritual gift. So there is no excuse as far as I can see from Scripture that allows us to opt out of this opportunity. And I keep saying it's an opportunity. Would you guys understand what that means? It's an opportunity. This is a privilege to be able to share our faith with others, to lead someone else to Jesus Christ. And if we understand the paradigm, if we understand that we are part of this eternal fire rescue department, if we look at ourselves as an eternal fire rescue worker, we will begin to understand how God sees us. Why? Because He's gifted you and called you. That's why. He's given you a testimony. He's given you and enhanced you in every way. He has given you every spiritual gift. You don't lack anything to perform your job. I don't know about you, but I can remember the day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I can remember the situation. And I remember only a few weeks prior to that day that I was so bummed out, so burned out with life, so fed up with trying different things to try to start a new life, turn a new chapter, turn a new page, whatever you want to call it, that I was actually so depressed that I really thought maybe I should just end it all. And I was out of frustration. I simply looked up into the sky and said, God, if you're real, let me know. A couple weeks later, I meet a Christian. A couple weeks, or a couple of days after that, I'm, I'm in church. A couple weeks after that, I hear the gospel and I give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. My life hasn't been the same since. Literally, I was plucked out of the flames of that eternal wrath by one person who cared enough about me to invite me not only to church, but to teach me about what the Lord Jesus Christ had done and to model that in front of me. And honestly, with all of the Christians that I knew before, that person, I saw them as hypocrites. I partied with most of them. And I thought, you know, being a Christian is no different than anything else. But this guy was different. And he wasn't afraid to show it. He wasn't afraid to speak it. He wasn't afraid to model it in front of me. And so this verse says, you don't lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. We know that the Bible says that Christ is going to return one day. And he says, I'm going to be looking for my workers. And when he says that he wants to be looking for his workers, he wants to know, have you been out there in the field? Have you been harvesting? Have you been planting that seed? Have you been watering? Have you been praying that God would till the soil of the heart? Verse 8, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a cool thing. You know, when you're centered in God's will, He holds you not only in His hand, but the Lord Jesus Christ says that He holds you in His hand and the Father holds you in His hand. You've got a double grip on you. You are firm to the end. And when you're in the will of God, then there's a joy that goes with that in service that you can't understand from any other perspective of life. Verse 9 says, God is faithful who has called you, there's the call again, into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. Now, what is that fellowship? What's Jesus Christ doing right now? What was the mission of Christ when he came the first time? To seek and to save the lost. That's what he said. What do you think he's doing right now? What do you think the spirit of God's doing right now? Is seeking and saving the lost. What do you think your responsibility and our responsibility is to be in fellowship with him? To sit in a pew and only come to church once a week. No. Okay. Continue the logic. We are to move forward with Christ. We're to be where he's working. We're to be 
actively seeking to save and rescue the lost. Now, I understand, we understand, it's not us who saves, right? It's the Spirit of God. But who's God's vessel? We are. We're the ones to take that message to the lost world. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, and then verses 4 through 6. Notice what Paul is again saying to the Corinthians, verse 1. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. He says you need to understand this whole idea of gifts because we really get things mixed up, don't we? Okay, we make gifts some mysterious thing that's out there in the ozone and somehow or another we appropriate it some weird way. Maybe we take tests, you know, on the internet or something and somehow or another stumble into our gifting. Eh, try it again. Verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. In other words, your gifts and my gifts, they're going to be different, but they're all synergized and brought together just like a team. He places us in this eternal fire rescue department and then he gives us certain responsibilities and certain gifts and certain calling to be able to synergize everything together. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. Now what's cool about Corinthians is it talks about those gifts. And Paul again goes to the analogy of the body, how each one of us is like a, a part of a body and we all fit together and we're all to be in unity working for the Savior. At the end of that chapter 12, he says, Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. So he says, I want you to desire these gifts. I want you to take that raw talent that you've got. And as God blesses and encourages you to use it, it becomes more and more refined and more and more usable. But he says, don't stop there. Desire the greater gifts. This is an important thing. But then he goes on to say, I'll show you something that's even more excellent. And in, in chapter 13, he begins talking about love. This is the whole love chapter. And he talks about the commitment of love. And he talks about the things of love and how love acts in certain ways that, that, God, that, uh, that love never fails. He gets to all of that, right? In chapter 13. And then he goes on to say in chapter 14. Notice in verse 1. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. And again, don't get in your mind this Old Testament concept of a prophet. Understand this is the fourth telling of truth. This means we internalize the Word of God and then we help and share that truth with others. That's what that's talking about. So he's saying that if you have certain inherent gifts and you've honed those gifts and skills that if you're faithful in a little that God says that he will make you faithful in much so desire those greater gifts don't stop with one or two or ten continue to accumulate continue to hone continue to build up but he says especially the gift of prophecy and do it in love why he goes on in, in the previous chapter, he says that even if you do all these great accomplishments for God and if you fail to do it in love, you've really achieved nothing. You're like a, an empty sound that doesn't make any sense. But if you do it in love, then there's an eternal capacity to what you're doing. That's why Jesus in Matthew 28 verses 18 and 19 says this, and then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. What's he really saying? He's saying, because I have gifted you, because I have called you, because I have set you apart, because I've made you part of this eternal fire rescue department, because I've trained you, because I have taught you all of these things, and I have led you, then I need you to go and do something for me. Reach people for the kingdom of God. So let's summarize really quickly where we are. All of these other verses, what are they teaching us? Okay, the first thing is the gift all believers have is the indwelling Holy Spirit. If you're truly born again, then the Spirit of God resides in you. That is your seal. The gift is not just for you, but it's also for your children, for those who are far off, which means that there's ripples to that effect. You are the one that God has called to reach the world. God gave you a certain inherent raw talent to be honed and to be used in his servant to rescue the lost and dying in this world. The gift that God has given you is unique 
and necessary for the body in advancing kingdom purposes. You have untapped potential and purpose, enriched in every way is the way the scripture puts it, and you lack absolutely no spiritual ability to perform your duty. You are without excuse, the scripture says, that your duty is the eternal fire rescue worker. Your gifts and abilities will look different from everyone else's, so don't compare yourself to anybody else. And then finally, you are to go and to proclaim the truth of God's word to a lost and dying world for kingdom purposes. So how do you work out of your gifts? How do you serve within your calling? I've heard it said oftentimes, you know, I, I talk to certain Christians and they say, well, I don't even know that I have a gift. Well, let me give you a couple starters here. What comes naturally to you? Conversation? Can you, like my dad often says, do you have the gift of gab? Can you talk to people? Can you, can you, can you make friends easily? That's a gift. What about math? I've never been particularly good at math. But you say, well, how can math lead anybody to the Lord? Well, I'll tell you what. If you became a tutor, you have a really nice opportunity as a portal into somebody's life. So math could be an opportunity to lead others to Christ. Sports. I mean, churches do sports clinics all the time. Any kind of, uh, you know, the, the whole Super Bowl thing, right? Uh, there was the, the testimony from the other team's players, right? And it's really cool to see that kind of thing because it, it inspires people. Not only the ability of the people who do the sports, but the testimony. What, about, what if you're just good in Bible study? What if you really like to get into the nuances of Scripture? That could be a huge benefit. What if you're an encourager? What if you just like to pat people on the back and give them an attaboy every once in a while just to help them move along? That's a gift. Cooking, what a gift. Cooking is a good gift that even in cooking, you have the ability to be able to lead others and to serve others. Child care, computers, automotive repair, it could be anything. And God gives it to you in raw talent. I mean, this is very true. If you're a parent, you know this because you look at your children, each one of them have different abilities. They're so different from one another. And yet they come with this raw set of gifts and talents that if they're honed for God's purposes, they can become very mighty. Now again, they may be in their raw state, but this means that we simply have to hone these gifts for God's purposes, to work on them, to make them useful and productive for kingdom purposes. So you can serve then in your calling. And this is the other barrier that a lot of people can't seem to get across. Well, I've never had that burning bush experience, Mark. I've never had that lightning bolt that kind of hit me between the eyes and said, oh, this is what you're supposed to be doing with the rest of your life. I've never had that kind of call. How do I know what my call is? I think that's fairly simple too. We over mystify these things. Start with your passion. What needs weigh heavy on your heart? When you see something that is an injustice and you say, you know, why isn't somebody doing something about that? That's a passion God's given to you. You have the vision to see that. Ten other people might pass right by that opportunity, but you see it. And you want to do something about it. What keeps you up at night? Besides chili. What keeps you up at night? <coughs> what is it that is in the back of your mind that you just can't get any rest until you know something gets resolved? What kind of problem do you think it's up to you to solve? You know, we have a neat little saying, your misery is your ministry. I think it's very true. You know, oftentimes you say, well, why isn't that church, you know, cleaned up better? Why, why doesn't somebody take care of that, that uh, elderly person's uh, driveway when it snows? Why aren't people doing, well, maybe it's your ministry. Maybe it's your misery that you're seeing. What's your passion? What situation around you drives you to action? You see, within your passion is your mission. That's your calling. And when you begin to understand that we are all connected together, just like Paul said, this is not cowboy time where we just say, hey, I got a passion, I'm out of here, boom, and you go take care of it. This is when we come to the body and we say to the body and, and say, you know, the Lord's really moving on me. There's something here that I, I'm not sure how to approach this, but would you pray with me? I think God wants me to start ministering to these people, to start meeting these people's needs. How do we best do that? You know, one that's been weighing on my heart lately, and, and this is a, a thing that I'm just being very vulnerable before everybody today, but I want you to understand something. It bothers me 
when I pull up to an intersection and there's a beggar there. It bothers me. It bothers me because I feel guilty. On one hand, I feel like sticking my hand in my pocket, grabbing a $100 bill and just throwing it out there. Not that I have one. But I, if I had one, I'd throw it out the, the window and say, here. But on the other hand, I'm thinking, well, does that just enable their, their lack of willingness to work or, or whatever the situation is? Now, I work with the homeless. Okay, uh, uh, Homeward Bound is the, is the organization within Grand Junction that has the homeless shelter downtown. And as an architect, I've been working with them to help develop a new uh, uh, whole complex and uh, to renovate their, their building. And so I'm very, very aware of what the homeless situation is like and why we have homelessness and why we have the disenfranchised within our society. But it bothers me as an individual to not take a more direct approach. So I've been praying about it. And I'm saying, Lord, what do, I, what do I need to do when I see an individual standing on the side of the road with a puppy or a child or in a wheelchair with a sign that says, I need food? What do I do? Because I know that there's plenty of government services out there. But what do I do? <laughs> see, that's what I'm talking about here. This is where you serve in your calling. I believe God's calling us, me, to a higher standard when it comes to working within our society, when we see beggars, when we have issues with victims of uh, uh, abuse or victims of uh, trafficking, all of these things. When there are orphans, I mean, all of these things, they weigh heavy on my heart. And so within our passion is our mission. And notice this, that we work out of our call in our gifting and we receive the greatest joy because here's the thing that's where Jesus is already at work you see Jesus is already at work in that bum's heart they don't know it probably but he's at work there because I as a Christian I pull up and I pray every single time I say Lord do I give them money should I give them a track should I get out and talk to them what do you want me to do and there have been certain clear times when I have been effectively led by God to be able to say that person needs money or that person needs some encouragement or that person needs a witness. And I've done that. And there's far more times when I just drive past them saying, Lord, what do I do? And so we work out of our call in our gifting and we receive the greatest joy. And there's no burnout there. You see, I think it's a noble thing within our American culture to say, I want to burn out for Jesus. But there's no biblical precedent for that. We're in a marathon, not in a sprint. The Bible says that we're to cross the finish line, not be the first ones to it. This is not a competition where all of us are trying to get there first and elbow each other out of the way and say, hey, God, look at my gifts. They're better than somebody else's. That's not the point. The point is that we're in this marathon and we're actually supposed to reach back and draw the next person up and lead them ahead of us and reach back and do the same for the next. That's the idea that God has for us. That's why there's no such thing as burning out for Jesus. Because when it's time for us to go home, lights out. Time to go. So God's vision is to save the world one person at a time. The vision for this church is to reach our community, state, nation, and the world with the gospel. Simply living out the Great Commission. God has placed you here in this church with a specific calling, a passion or a zeal to meet a need that you have the gifting to meet. So my encouragement to you is this. Begin praying about it. And start saying, God, where do I fit in? What is my gift? What is my calling? What is, and start in those places that I said, what's your passion? Ask the Lord to clarify what your passion is. Lord, what inherent gifting do I have that I can make myself of service to my brethren and how I can reach the world and how we can move your vision forward? to reach the world with the gospel. If God's vision is to save the world one person at a time, then within that passion is your mission and your purpose. The only way that you're going to find true and deep and lasting joy is to join Jesus where he's already at work. And he will help you see where, that, where he's at work through that passion. So Paul indicates that we are to be uh, brought together as the body of Christ for a particular purpose. And so what is that purpose? We are the eternal fire rescue department. 
Jude says it this way in verse 22 and 23. Be merciful to those who are in doubt. Notice this next part. Save those by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained or corrupted by the flesh. But we can't live out the Great Commission without first understanding the Great Commandment. So the Great Commission flows from the Great Commandment. Mark chapter 12, verses 29 down through 31, Jesus was once asked, what is the great commandment? What is the great law? What's the one thing I need to focus on, Jesus? And this is what he said. He says, this is the most important one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is like to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So last weekend, I was able to attend a training with a few other people uh, from our church that went. And they had a little sheet called the Sheet of Shame. And it had nine boxes in a little matrix on it. And in the center of the box, you put your name. And they said, okay, now, in the other eight boxes around that center, put down the names of your neighbors. Now, I live in a rural location. And so knowing my neighbors isn't so hard. So I, ah, I got this one handled. It's not a sheet of shame for me. Filled in all the other boxes, no problem. What's their children's name? Mm, well, okay, shame's coming on me. I don't really know their children's names. I guessed. What is most important to your neighbor? I don't know him well enough to even ask. Does your neighbor know the Lord? Now... A little shame faced. I don't know that they do, and I don't know that they don't. I've always tried to be a good testimony to my neighbors, but I've never really had the opportunity or sought the opportunity to really find out where they are spiritually. And so I learned something that the Great comm Commission flows from the Great Commandment. Are we loving our neighbors? We don't, we're not loving anybody if we don't know their name. How many of you attend these services and still don't know people's names here? I, me, just, okay. Seats of shame tonight, right? I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I just want us to understand that if Christ said the single most important thing is to love our God and then love ourselves enough to be able to love our neighbors, then maybe we ought to know their names. Maybe we ought to know what's important to them. And so we are this eternal fire rescue department, and we must never forget this duty. It is our job to seek and rescue the lost, those who are dead and dying in this world, condemned to the eternal fires of God's wrath. It's not a popular subject to consider what hell is. And I'm not a hellfire and brimstone preacher. But we can't ignore it. If we don't know our neighbors well enough to know their names and what's meaningful to them and what their spiritual state is, we are not loving our neighbors. And we're not performing as an eternal fire rescue department at all. So I want to change your thoughts about church just for a second. I want you to challenge what you think church really is. i got a little video here. It's very short. And with this, I would like you to really stop and think, what is church all about? Because as far as I'm concerned, the scripture teaches us that we are like a fire department. We come here to train and to encourage and to be a brotherhood and to be a fraternity and, to, and help one another, but not to come. We're here to go. So what good is it if I'm a fireman and I've never fought a fire? I've been through all the trainings, I've been through all the certifications, and I've never fought a fire. What good is it if I'm an EMS worker and I've got all my certifications? I got my first responder, I got my EMT, I got my EMT IV, I got my paramedic. I go on to nursing and I, and I never treat a patient. I never ride an ambulance. I never arrive on scene first. What good is it? The challenge is, for us as Christians, 
That's how we treat church. We come, we soak, sit, we soak, we sour. But we never get out in the community. We never love our neighbors the way it's intended to be. So give a little view of this uh, video. I'm afraid I don't have the sound for it this evening. It's just music, so you're not missing anything. But check out this video. See if it doesn't touch your heart. Pretty powerful little three-minute deal, isn't it? So what if we change our mind about what church is? I want to ask you to do something for me. I would like you to think about five people that you know that you don't think know the Lord Jesus Christ. Think of them right now. You know a few? Write them down. You don't have to do it right this second, but write them down. And begin praying for them. And with that prayer, ask the Lord to open that opportunity for you to share your testimony. And I'll make it really easy on you. Sharing your testimony doesn't have to be a big deal. You only have to do three things. Tell them what you were like before you met Jesus Christ. Tell them how you met Jesus Christ. And tell them what it's like after you met him. Can you do that? That's a simple thing, isn't it? When you write that down, that's called an oikos list. That's your sphere of influence. It could be people in your family. It could be people at work or at school. It doesn't make any difference. But let's start acting like we are eternal fire rescue workers. Let's go out there in that community and really get the job done. In a few weeks from now, we're going to be having a little brainstorming session with this, with this church. I'd like to invite as many of you uh, to come and be part of that because we're going to be part of an association-wide outreach into our community. The first step for the association is to do something really simple, and that's just to ask all 22 of our churches for 24 hours of prayer. 10 days worth, that's all we're asking. And you say, wow, 24 hours of prayer, that's an awful lot, brother. Well, not you praying for 24 hours. You may only have to pray a half hour of that, but if we each pray a half hour, and it all adds up really quickly, doesn't it? We did this one other time as a church, and people who had never prayed more than 10 minutes in their life came and prayed through, we had certain little stations set up, and each station was broken down as a five-minute segment. We had 12 stations, and each one had five little topics, and we asked them to pray for that one topic for one minute. And people who had never prayed for 10 minutes in their life prayed for an entire hour. It was life-changing for many people. So if you would, be in prayer. Write down these people, pray for them, and then seek opportunity. And we will be moving and mobilized to reach this community. Let's pray. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, I just praise you so much for everyone's attention this evening and what a great blessing, uh, blessing it's been. Please, dear God, help us to take seriously our responsibility to reach others for you. Help us to not only write down and to pray for these people, but I pray, Father, that you would give us opportunity to be able to reach them. Lord God, help us to reach those who are standing on the street corners with signs in their hands. Help us to do more than just throw money into a pot that goes to some community outreach. But Father, instead, let us do it for eternal purposes. Let us truly, truly love our neighbor as you loved us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.